Well, thank you, everybody. I just want to let you know that it's such an honor and a pleasure to be able to kind of share my passion. Um, as everybody knows, I'm both a CFI, I, and PharmD, and uh, I just love to put it together. And I was just telling Jason I was on a flight down to Fort Wayne to uh, give a uh, presentation on Jason's favorite medication, Xarelto. And uh, during the icing of the airplane, I got three calls from the hospital in order to do a really, really complicated anticoagulation patient that had a thing called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and that's really boring stuff. But I used that time to call the stewardess and declare an emergency on my part where I had to actually open up my cell phone and uh, save a life. So uh, it's, uh, I do it all the time. It's 24 hours a day, and I'm glad I can share just a, maybe a few of my 35 years of experience of doing this. So I'm going to start out with a disclosure, and my disclosure is this, that uh, I would, I am not actually Jason's uncle, but I wish that I was. And uh, the second disclosure that I want to kind of share with everybody, let's put this on here. My disclaimer is, is I'm a clinical pharmacist, a uh, doctor of pharmacy with a specialty in cardiology, um, is everybody does want me to be, but I'm not a physician, and I'm not an AME, so I don't have office hours, and this presentation is definitely for information and purposes for all my M0A friends to help get you through the FAA medical journey is what I call it. It can get really, really complicated out there with the thousands of medications that are out there, and unfortunately, the FAA doesn't publish the safe medication list, and actually uh, I got mine from uh, being an AOPA member, and that it, even that list has got some flaws in it. They have some medications on there that uh, haven't been on the market for many, many years. My further disclaimer is Jason asked me to talk because I'm very passionate about aviation and health. So let's start off with my background. Uh, there's my uh, lovely wife, Yvonne, who, uh, that's my second selfie ever taken. That's on our way to come see Jason for the showing of the movie, Flying Again. Uh, there's my two dogs. I don't have prop or rudder or strut, and my son is not named Bernoulli, but uh, there is Maya, the golden doodle, and Amelia, the rescue dog. And there's my family and Jason and Scott in front of the first showing that I, actually a surprise showing for me of the movie Flying Again, and it's really fantastic. I got to share with at least 10 times. And there's my uh, wife and my son, Andrew. So who am I? I'm, I got my private pilot's uh, certificate from Orville Wright. Uh, he's the one to sign me off on October 23rd, uh, 1984. I got my instrument rating in 92, commercial rating 2005, and my CFI on March 6, 2007 at 1620 Eastern Standard Time, 2020 Zulu, CFII on June 30th, 2013, with only 10 hours left on the uh, recency of my uh, taking my knowledge test. So I got it 10 hours before it was going to run out. And there I am uh, in my little lab coat and over at Oakwood Hospital Medical Center, which is now turned into Beaumont Hospital in Dearborn, Michigan, with my bow tie. And uh, the reason why I wear a bow tie is because it makes me look taller. Uh, so there's all my credentials, doctor of pharmacy, cardiology. I, I teach at the medical school. I teach at the pharmacy school. I teach at the PT school. And I teach at the other college in Michigan, the second best college in Michigan, uh, the University of Michigan Pharmacy School. Um, I also have the number one article in the world on cardiopulmonary resuscitation and acute cardiolife. You can look it up. I'm really hot in all the communist countries because they always keep asking me for my article. I do yoga twice a day and twice a week, and that's me in the background. And the three biggest fears of the general public is public speaking, which I'm doing now, flying, which I always do, and death. So I have at least two out of the three, and uh, the third one I really hopefully will never happen for a long, long time. The biggest fear of students and pilots is getting and keeping the medical. Um, I've had more people come up to me, and they're not worried about training. They're not worrying about doing stalls or steep turns or anything else. The biggest fear that they have is getting their medical. Yesterday, I actually had a cardiologist who'd been out of flying for 43 years, a cardiologist, and his worst fear was getting back into flying, but it wasn't getting back into flying, it was getting the medical. So let's look at FARs, and uh, FAR 
you can't fly if you know for any reason that you have a medical condition that'll keep that'll keep you out non-safe and you have a medical certificate that's necessary for the pilot operation. If you are taking a medication or receiving other treatment for the medical condition that actually will make you drowsy or do something that will make you unable to meet the requirements of the medical certificate, that is against the FAR. So you're taking a medication, also FAR 91.17 says no person may act or attempt to be a crew member underway that's going to taking a medication that in any way is going to compromise the safety of the flight. So there's the infamous medical certificate. We've all filled it out. If we're over 40 and looking for a third class medical, the biggest thing if you look at over in this section 17A, it says this. Do not do you currently use any medicine prescription, and I underline this, non-prescription. So what does non-prescription mean? Over-the-counter medications, taking Benadryl, taking some of the cough syrups. You can get a lot of things that over-the-counter that used to be prescription that in some way may actually impair your faculties and may actually cause you to be unsafe in the airplane. So let's look at some of the more requirements. If you have a third class, and if you are fortunate enough to be under 40, that your third class medical is going to last you for 60 calendar months. If you received your third class medical and you're over 40, then it's going to be for 24 calendar months. So first class is going to be 12 months if you're less than 40 years old, if 40 greater than, uh, greater than 6 calendar months. The second class is going to be for 12 calendar months. Now, this is something new that not too many people have heard about, and they're called khakis, and I'm not talking about pants that Jim Harbaugh wears at the University of Michigan. We're talking about conditions, and AME can issue, and it's changed. So you don't have to get a special issuance from Oklahoma City if you have arthritis, asthma, colitis, hepatitis C, hypertension, hyperthyroid, kidney stones, migraines, prediabetes, which means before you have glucose levels that are really high, prostate, renal cancer, testicular cancer. This is something your AME can actually give you a certificate while you're getting your medical certificate. So I always use the pilot checklist and the M in I am safe is medications. Have I been taking any medications, prescription, over-counter drugs that will actually make me unsafe in the aircraft? So medications play a role in our decision and keep, our, keep us medically and keep us healthy. These medications save lives. So it's not like every medication you take in some way is going to impair you flying. Actually, it's going to make you fly longer and feel better and last a very long time. So I always like to say youth words. What does FIT mean? FIT means in good health, be able to get your first class, second class, third class certificate. It's a verb also, being in the right shape and size. And the biggest thing is can you fit in the aircraft? Can, you cannot put a 280-pound, 6'4 person in a Cessna 152. So who would be the perfect pilot on and off medications? Someone greater than 17 years old, blood pressure less than 155 or 95, blood glucose between 70 and 100, good LDL down between 100 and 140, and HDL 50, and they eat the Mediterranean diet and work out for the magic 150 minutes. So that's 30 minutes, five times a week. Maybe this guy could do it. And there's my statistics, 63, and my blood pressure is pristine, and my LDL is good. Now, these are the medications that are unsafe per the FAA. So you can't fly if you are chronically taking these medications. Tranquilizers, antidepressants, anxiolytic stimulant. Anxiolytics are things like Valium, Xanax, things like that. And anticonvulsants, things like Phenytoin and Keppra. But there is, and this, this is really good news, the SSRIs, things like Prozac, Zoloft, Celexa, Lexapro are now allowed with a special insulin. Now the reason why they did it, because I kept sending in reports as that these are the safest medications. These having, having depression and being on these medications does not cause any untoward effects when you're flying. Actually being unpressed, and there's very few side effects of these medications, Finally, the FAA has come around and said, you can be on SSRIs, still fly, but you have to get a special instrument. If you are taking Vicodin, Oxycontin, Altram, those are no-nos. That means you are in pain and taking a narcotic. Bottom line is, 
If the medication affects your mood, concentration, or cognition, or wakefulness, you do not fly. Some of the common disease states of all of you out there and most of the general pilot population have some form of hypertension, diabetes, pain, insomnia, and also we're going to talk about some over-the-counter medications. There's a long here paragraph here. Really, hypertension is a silent killer. Your blood pressure is really high, you're perfusing, you're sending blood to the brain, it loves it, but eventually your heart's going to poop out, it's going to cause kidney disease, could cause bleeding in the retina, and then start to form plaque. And these are like things where the cholesterol kind of goes and starts living in your coronary arteries that can then cause a heart attack. If it could also lead to a stroke, if your blood pressure is really high, let's say a systolic of 220, which is your top number when you take your blood pressure, that's going to be a brain attack. Bottom line is, is if you can keep your blood pressure at 155 over 95 and have at least these readings of 155 or 95 or less, you qualify for not being hypertensive. Well, you, you still may have hypertension, but you qualify for getting your pilot certificate and your medical. So if you're not taking medications, your blood pressure is less than 155 or 95, congratulations, you can get your medical. If you are taking one or up to probably three, not probably, but three FAA safe medications, you're less than 155, you are good to go and you'll get your medical. Now think of your arteries as pipes. If you have a normal pipe and normal amount of, let's say, water going through it, in our case it's going to be blood, you have a normal blood pressure. If you have too much blood going through and the pipe is still the same size, you're going to have high blood pressure. If you are, your pipes or your coronary arteries are very, very narrow and you still have a normal amount of blood, your blood pressure is going to be high. These are uh, just a few of the medications you'll see used in hypertension. Patients, they'll prescribe what they call water pills. Uh, an example of these will be hydrochlorothiazide, Lasix, it got its name because it lasts six hours. What it does is it gets water out of the body, off of your legs, out of your lungs. Things that dilate, which means the blood vessels actually get bigger so more blood can go through it, is a medication called Norvas. Things that lower your heart rate, like Topol XL, Coreg, and Indrol. What they actually do is they deliver more blood to the brain, the kidneys, and extremities, and actually make your heart stronger. Vasodilators, things that get rid of water, ACE inhibitors, anything that ends in Pril is going to be an ACE inhibitor. All these medications on the bottom that you see here, lisinopril, acupril, and epil, they save people's lives. People live longer, they lower their blood pressure, decrease their risk for a stroke, decrease the risk for hypertension, and actually protect their kidneys. So these are my recommendations to help reduce hypertension. All bathrooms should be one mile away. Take your, go really fast to get to the bathroom, then you can take a nice leisurely walk back. All fast food restaurants should be very expensive. Healthy food should be cheap, and all chairs should be like pogo sticks. You just have to synchronize it if you are sitting and listening to a presentation. Illness. If you wake up and you have a headache that's not related to some festivities from the night before, you could also be going through caffeine withdrawal and your heart is pounding, then you may actually, your blood pressure may be way too high. If you start getting a headache, that could actually be an indication you might be having a stroke and you've got to lower that blood pressure. Or if you forget to take some medication you're taking twice a day that's used for hypertension, then if you miss your dose, then all of a sudden your body's going to say, whoa, look, nothing is holding me down. I'm just going to go wild again, and your blood pressure gets too high, and you can get a stroke. Medication. Medications, if they make you feel dizzy, that's definitely not the time that you want to go flying. This could maybe be a side effect from one of your antihypertensive medications. Whenever you start a new medication, you need to wait at least three weeks to make sure you're not going to get any untoward side effects before flying. Diabetes, what it actually means is sweet urine, and this is where insulin is produced in the pancreas and it's needed to go to glucose, but in diabetes, either you don't have any insulin that comes from the pancreas or you have poor or very little insulin getting to the glucose in the cell and breaking it down and getting it inside that cell for energy. Diabetes type 1 is where the pancreas produces zero insulin. Diabetes type 2 is where the insulin that's being produced is very poorly functional. So can a diabetic get a certificate from the FAA? The answer is absolutely. 
There's thousands of pilots out there that have first, second, and third class medicals that are flying, and these pilots will be treated with oral agents. But here's the big but. The pilot applicant needs to get a special issuance in order to get that first medical certificate. Initially, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on down at the Aerospace Medical Certificate Division down in Oklahoma. And that's where you can get your first class, second class, and third class. That's where everything goes to. That's where all the records go. And what they do is when they're looking at diabetes, they're going to read all the reports from your primary physician. They're going to be looking at the meds, doses, any side effects. They're going to be looking to how sweet you are. And that's called a hemoglobin A1C. Normal is somewhere between 4.5 and 6. And then they have the physician look at your eyes, kidneys, heart, and brain. Some of the oral medications that uh, diabetes type 2 patients would be taking, and these are what I call squeezers. What they do is they almost kind of like ring out the pancreas and get that insulin out there, glyburide, amaryl, glucotrol, things that actually decrease the production of glucose in the liver, metformin, things that actually increase insulin production. It's called Genuvia. And your goal is to keep your glucose under control, have a normal A1C, have no hypoglycemic events, and then you are not going to be a risk to aviation safety. People taking insulin, this is going to be diabetes type 1. The only certificate that a diabetes type 1 patient can get is a third class medical and they need a special issuance. There is also some criteria and it's very rigorous. They have to have two hemoglobin A1Cs within 90 days that are normal. Keep a diary of your glucose levels. If you're over 40, you're going to get an EKG reading to make sure because these people Patients who have diabetes type 1 have a high risk for having a heart attack, which I see a lot in the hospital. Here's some of the um, examples of insulin that's injected. Humalog and Lantus are the big ones. Now, if you are a diabetes type 1, third class medical, you need to do a few things before you go flying. A half an hour before flight, you have to check your glucose. If it's less than 100, then you must take 10 grams of glucose. So they have these glucose tablets, which I'm pointing over here that you have on board, that you need to take a half an hour before you're going to go flying if your glucose level is low. If it's between 100 and less than 300, you're good to go. If it's greater than 300, you have to cancel the flight. And then what happens during the flight? We're well, supposed to really measure glucose level one in one hour intervals and a half an hour before landing. And the same thing goes true. If it's greater than 300, you have to land immediately. Of course, you have to have your glucometer out there to test your glucose. Now, can you imagine being hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia, being in adverse weather, trying to shoot an instrument approach, and in that case, if you can't take your blood glucose, you take a 10-gram glucose load, and then you measure it after you land or at least one hour later. If you are unable and don't have a glucometer at all, just take 20 grams. So that's a few tablets you have to take before you shoot that approach. Hyperglycemia symptoms are going to be blurred vision, confusion, headache, fatigue, and you're going to have fruity breath and you possibly can even go to a coma. So that doesn't sound like something that I want happening in the airplane to someone who has diabetes. Having too low of a blood sugar, shakiness, dizziness, sweatiness, you can't, inability to form tests. I got a call uh, over one of the common frequencies from another instructor that was out flying. I was flying from Kalamazoo back to Ann Arbor. And the instructor got me on and he says, I'm telling my student to make a 30 degree, 30 degree bank, left hand turn to a heading of 180. And he looked at me and had no idea what I was talking about. And he started pushing the plane down. He said, I repeated it like four or five times. So I said, I want you to look at somewhere on his belt somewhere, do you see a little box? And he says, yes, I do. And I said, well, that's an insulin pump. What you need to do is land as soon as possible, find uh, either a glass of milk or some orange juice or apple juice. I didn't even care if you maybe had some kind of like kidney dysfunction. And I said, you need to land as soon as possible. He's probably hypoglycemic and probably took too much insulin in this pump. So illness, if they feel jittery and you got up late and didn't have time for any nourishment, that could be a sign of hypoglycemia. If you took, are taking too much and you forgot maybe to take your antihyperglycemic medication, you actually maybe have too high of a glucose. So it's never too late to utilize IM Safe checklist. 
we talk a little bit about pain. Any discomfort, anybody that's physically suffering, that doesn't sound like to me on how and to go flying. Things that are over the counter that you can get for pain, you can get Tylenol, Naproxen, Motrin, they all work great for inflammation. But think about this way. If you're having acute pain, do not fly. That's if you do fly, you're not doing the I am safe checklist. If you're just using this just for prophylaxis, let's say for an arthritic condition, and you're not having any pain, it's okay to take these medications. But you gotta mention, so what about sleep? We have like no idea on what sleep is. We just know it's really important to the body and rejuvenate. And that's part of the I am safe checklist too. So what is sleep? We don't know. The nervous system kind of shuts down for rest. You go through these cycles where you kind of re-energize and you start dreaming, and then you go into a deep sleep where you're actually just resting the brain for a little while. So medications that are out there, they have Benadryl, Ambien, Lunesta, Restoril, and Rosarum. Now the one that I want you to never, ever, ever take, especially if you're over the age of 65, is Benadryl. Uh, really, it's an antihistamine. When you wake up, you have a hangover effect. The medication stays in your body for 60 hours, which is almost three days. So anytime you have to take these medications more than one or two times of the week at the most, then you should not be flying. And there's also a section in my book that will tell you how long you need to wait if you take one of these medications for insomnia. And so we talked about the hangover effect of Benadryl, two and a half days. Ambien, uh, the biggest side effect, you know, I had patients complaining to me. They said, you know something, on Ambien I can't gain weight. And I said, well, wait a second. So they tested their weight before they went to sleep. They tested their weight. They went on the scale after they got up, and they had gained like a pound. And what they didn't know is the Ambien caused them to sleepwalk, go to the refrigerator and eat everything in the refrigerator, and they come back to sleep, and they never remembered it. It also causes hallucinations, personality changes, and you need, if you are taking uh, ambient for insomnia, you need to refrain from flying for at least 24 hours after the last dose. Some of the over-the-counter medications. So if you look on the side of the label, you always look, they're going to give you some side effects. So these side effects could be just as bad and they can hurt you in the performance of flying an airplane. If the label says do not operate heavy machinery while taking, that includes an airplane. That's not a skip loader, that's not a car. We're talking about an airplane that's going 90 knots through the air. Some examples, we already talked about Motrin, Aleve. Some of the over-the-counter antihistamines, which are actually fantastic. Allegro is actually the first one okayed by the FAA because a lot of United Airlines pilots were using it with very little, if any, kind of drowsiness from. Sudafed, that's one of the best kind of decongestants you can get even though you have to sign your life away because if you get a whole bunch of them, you can make meth. I get a lot of questions on color blindness. Color blindness has been around since we started using vision standards for aviators. Why is green and red such a big deal? Well, we have our lights are red and green, our beacon is green, our charts have red and green in it, and we for light gun signals red and green, our pappies and our vazies have red and white. So that's why it's a big deal. Now, can you get your pilot's license with if you have color blindness? Well, absolutely. If you can't pass the Ishihara test, there's a whole bunch of other options that you can do. This is the biggest question that I get from Jason when he sends me some of the medical things. You can do the Optech 900 Vision, Farnsworth, if people are really interested in color blindness and they have color blindness and they want, if you need some help, I can send you both of these slides. It'll help you a lot. I've helped probably at least maybe five to ten people get through their certificate with color blindness. And these are just some of the examples. There's the Farnsworth and there's some of the other tests that they can do where they'll show you red and green. Also, the one that has the, actually the best that some of the AMEs don't use is the Born Devorine pseudo isochromatic plates. So if you want a third class medical, you can do a light gun test. That's what I did for my first student and just went out and they flashed it and I had an FAA guy in there with me and when they flashed it, he had say red, say green, say white and he passed. Now this can only be done, uh, they have a thing called a signal light test which is only done during the day and there's also one for night if you don't pass that and there's a whole bunch of information in there that I won't go through due to
time, but you do have options in order to pass from colorblindness. Let's talk about the Pilots Protection Act. We have lost a lot of pilots in the industry, at least 60,000. And uh, we are losing pilots dramatically. So luckily we have data from the sport pilots. They look at 10-year data and they just use their driver's license and not get a third class medical. Not one accident happened during those 10 years. So what they do is they still require you to go through a biannual flight review, but you only use your pilot certificate. So from that, now what's going to happen when the Pilots Protection Act comes to fruition? During the flight reviews, the instructors will then have extra responsibility to evaluate their pilot's physical and cognitive condition. I know that's going to put a lot of pressure on the CFIs, but I think we're up to it. And your ability, they're going to test also your ability to operate the aircraft. Um, so some of the few things, the proposed legislation that's already passed through the Senate will allow pilots using their driver's license to conduct VFR conditions, also IFR, no faster than 250 knots, in aircraft not more than five passengers, and these are like big airplanes, not, no more than 6,000 pounds gross weight. So you can get it for VFR, IFR, if you've had a valid third class medical, even including a special issuance within 10 years, you will never need a medical again. If you get a special issuance and if you need it, say for diabetes type 2, you only need to get it once. If you've not had a medical in 10 years, you will need to get a third class medical. And once you get that first one, then you'll never need it to get it again. You will also need to see your primary care physician. There will be an FAA form that the PCP, the primary care physician, needs to sign and have a form for your logbook. And this is where the PCP is also said we'll need to acknowledge they are not aware of any medical conditions for you to fly safely. Some added resources is my book. And thank you for your attention. And I always end with questions, answers, jokes. So let me kind of go over to the question section here. I'm multitasking. I'm not as good as Jason at this, but I definitely can look to see the questions here. Jason, is there anything that you can kind of see or like offhand while I was uh, speaking? Sorry, Larry. It took me a, a second to unmute myself there. Uh, anyways, guys, if you have any questions for Larry, maybe he chimed in on something. He said, man, I want to know more about that. Or, hey, this is my specific situation. Can you help me with this? Uh, more information on the Pot Protection Act, whatever it may be. You've got what I call the handy dandy go to webinar control panel. Underneath that, you'll see the questions tab. If you're watching this on a tablet or any device like that, you can tap the little question mark there and get those questions to come up that way. And you can type in your question, and Larry will see that. I can see that. Matt can see that. Ashley can see that. Uh, the M0A.com team can. Uh, uh, see that and get you an answer. Most importantly, Larry can uh, read that uh, answer there for you uh, with that. So, uh, Larry, I'll put myself back on mute here for a bit because it's loud. Again, guys, I'm at the Sebring Light Sport Expo <laughs> just out of Starbucks here now uh, to get some Wi-Fi from uh, uh, after the expo. So that's why it's loud. I apologize. I'll put myself on mute. And, Larry, you can take some questions there. Okay, well, I'll start out with Kent. Yeah, the bow tie is real. Um, I uh, do tie in myself and uh, actually has some evidence base to it where uh, I used to wear really long ties and when you kind of talk to patients, that long tie picks up a lot of bugs. I kind of work in a cesspool of viruses and fungi and all that other stuff. But yeah, people used to see what lunch I had and then going to the bathroom was tough. Um, for Tim, he was asking me about Xeralto with there being no testing and actually uh, that's the reason why I was down in Fort Wayne talking to a whole bunch of cardiologists about Xeralto and you know you see Brian Vickers and all that stuff and this is a, uh, a really really safe and fabulous drug no matter what you see the lawyers saying about it and I was one of the people that was instrumental in getting it on the FAA safe list I had two pilots that had atrial fibrillation that weren't doing very well on Coumadin, and Coumadin used to be called rat poison. And this one you don't have to monitor, because you don't have to monitor because it's really so good. And so uh, I sent all the data to the FAA, and then all of a sudden it started to show up as an FAA safe medication. So within probably 48 hours, 
I got a corporate pilot and United Airlines pilot on Xarelto, and they're back up flying in two weeks. So that's, a, a, you know, I guess point for me, but uh, this is just something that I really, really love to do. Question about lung nodular densities detected on CT scan. Are they disqualifying or do they probably need to be checked out? And that's from Krishnan. And uh, it all depends on what kind of nodes that they are and what kind of densities there are. And so once you get the biopsy, I mean, this is my kind of like, at least I have a little bit of experience with that. As long as they're benign and you really don't need uh, any kind of excitation or any kind of chemo or radio, uh, radiation, you're probably going to need at least the biopsy results. You're going to need your primary care physician's records, and you're probably going to need the person that does the biopsy to make sure it's not, if it's benign, malignant, or whatever you need to do. Um, I have a question, well, kind of comment from Norman that says, I'm 76 trying to get my certificate. Well, you should have no problem. Um, you really don't need to wait if you're healthy. If your blood pressure is less than 155 over 95, you'll be good to go. And uh, so a question actually from Bob said, like, it seems to me that I think this is supposed to be 155 over 95 is actually very high. And uh, he's right. He said the doctor would scream if mine were that high. And that's, that kind of shows you how lenient actually the FAA is. Now, most of the national guidelines, at least for people over 60, if you've got to be less than 150 over 90, and if you're less than 60, what, less than 140 over 90. So the FAA is actually kind of like giving us more leniency, which I thought was exactly the opposite of what they normally do. So, yeah, if you can, 155 and 95 is probably very high, at least in my book. If you can get it down to like 140 over 90, Bob, I think that would be absolutely fantastic and you'll live a very, very long and happy life. Uh, Alexis, my friend, do you actually think that the Pilots Protection Act will be fully passed into law? Well, I'm a positive person. Um, I thought actually it was going to be passed last year, right before Oshkosh, and then, then the Airlines uh, Pilots Association, who weren't even representing the pilots, came out and said, well, we don't like this, and it kind of put it back a little bit. But I do. Uh, it's going to take a little bit longer to get through the House of Representatives. It's fully passed through the Senate. But um, it's going to take a while. Uh, I don't like to make guesses, but if I could, hopefully, I'm hopefully before Oshkosh, which is going to be in end of July. Um, another one, any idea when the Pilot Protection Act will pass and be activated, Mark? Kind of like address that. But uh, my guess is as good as yours. I don't know anything about politics. I just know that those people up there, they have a few hinted agendas. Uh, they're probably going to try and bundle it with uh, some Highway and Safety Act to it. But uh, I think with the backing of all the House of Representatives, I mean, I personally have sent out probably five or six letters to my congressmen and my senators, and I'm going to still keep doing sending letters. So if you have access and you want to send a letter, tell your representatives how important it is to pass the Pilots Protection Act too, and that will really help us get moving even faster forward. Can you speak a little bit about Imitrex? subcutaneous injections. And uh, yeah, um, actually it's one of the safest ones around. It's been along for a long, long time. And uh, the last time I looked, it was okay. But you don't want to have a migraine when you go out flying. But Imitrex is on the safe uh, medication list. At least the last time I looked, they keep changing it all the time. But Imitrex is actually a great uh, medication use. If you can give it subcutaneous, you know, you're doing a great job because a lot of people are what I call needle nihilists. They don't like to inject themselves. Imitrex works instantly and it works really well. Well, if the headache doesn't go away in like uh, 20 to 30 minutes, you can give another injection. Um, have the new medical requirements for the Pilots Protection Act passed the House or just the Senate? And this comes from Heather. It's just passed the Senate. Right now they're working on the HR part, which is the House of Representatives. Again, it's going to be, you know, they work on a whole different schedule. Like if someone calls me or if I get beep, I get them an answer usually within 30 seconds to a minute. Well, uh, politicians work on a whole different thing. They, they get pushed off to a different side if they're one of their cronies to go, and it's kind of like give and take. But like I said, I am really, really hoping that it'll pass before Oshkosh. Norman said he had a mitral valve repair. 
Well, I hope you're doing great. And uh, what uh, that's going to take a little while longer. It's probably going to take at least probably six months. But all you really need to do is you're going to have have to have a stress test. You're going to have your CV surgeon that kind of put it in, and a clean bill of health from your PCP, and you should be good to go. Mitral valve repair actually does not even cause a new heart valve. Actually, you're just repairing the one that you got, and those have the best results when you look at the literature. Low sartan for hypertension, good or bad, good. It's on the safe medication list, and that's actually the one we use exclusively in the hospital. And uh, for low sartan, really the only kind of side effects, you've got to watch your potassium levels, and sometimes people, 1 to 3%, will get a little dry chicle cough for Jacob. So now you own me. You have your own personal pharmacist, uh, flight instructor. So you can call me anytime uh, for those people out there who want to call for any questions. Um, you can email me at pilotlarry7 at gmail.com. I'll be more than happy to answer any question that you have or get you in touch with somebody that will actually kind of help you move forward. Like I refer a lot of people to my AME. I'm uh, in Canton, Michigan, which is close to Ann Arbor, in between Detroit and Ann Arbor. Um, why is the weather so bad at 1 Delta 2? It's probably what well, we could blame it on the polar vortex, or we'll talk uh, about the tsunami that came through that keeps changing. I don't know why. At KIRB, I'm always getting uh, probably 90 degree, 29 crosswinds on runway 2406. Uh, very distinguished, I might add. Oh, thanks, Kent. I really appreciate that. Uh, question from Ron, my man. Uh, he is uh, third class medical expires 531.16, no health changes in two years. Well, Ron is going to be a poster child for my AMA because I'll bet you his blood pressure is peachy, even though he does root for the Buckeyes. But as we know, Michigan State and Ohio State, we get along really, really well. Jeff's not on the webinar, but he's my other Ohio State guy. So. I got here from Bob, 155 or 95. Sorry for this mis -type. Oh, Bob, you know, we're friends. But yeah, anything 155 or less, and you're good to go. Over to counter, bear 81 milligrams of aspirin once a day. So, my question to Peter is why are you taking it? Is this because you've had a heart attack at one time, or you're just trying to prevent a heart attack? Well, there's no evidence showing that you need to take it to prevent a heart attack, and it'll save you some money. Uh, what airport do I instruct out of? Uh, KARB, Alpha Romeo Bravo, and Arbor, Michigan. Now, I don't know if they call it international or whatever it is, but um, 3,850 foot long runway. We're right next to the University of Michigan, so we get a lot of med flights going out. We have the uh, U of M survival copter. So I know some of the, uh, the flight nurses on there, and they're a really good crew. But yeah, so if you want to have a lot of low ceilings, a lot of crosswinds, and be very cold and learn how to use a Tannis heater, KARB is a place to come. Uh, well, I need to continue with every year visits, the AME, and a cardiologist from Norman. Um, if you kind of let me know why you're seeing a cardiologist, I can kind of help you with that question. Okay, while filling out the medical and doctor's visits, do you list them all? like a visit due to a cold? No. Really what they're looking for, they're looking for like your annual. Or if you're going, let's say, to an endocrinologist uh, for your hypothyroid or hyperthyroidism. And uh, so, no, you don't have to put every time that you go. We're, they're just looking at major visits. And uh, usually I always just put in my annual because that's the only time I really go to the physician. But there's not enough space to do them all. But we're talking like Mark Major visits they can do. Is there any regulation for ADD medications? Okay, this comes from Jose. Um, the answer to your question is we don't, uh, because the FAA is about as conservative as uh, as conservative can be. Um, the thing about it is, is if you have a letter from your primary care physician that you're doing and said you've not had any side effects, you've not had any problems, that sometimes, that, at least my AME, sometimes may go through a special issuance for that. But ADD is not really addressed. But the, the problem with the ADD medications, they're very similar to amphetamine. And sometimes the FAA doesn't take too kindly anything that ends in like hydrocodone or codeine or morphine. And when they see stimulants such as amphetamine, 
then uh, they're not gonna, they're probably not going to go do it. They're not going to know what to do with that. So uh, attention type medications, we just kind of talked about that. I don't take anything, but never been on it. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of like those gray areas. And uh, so I would definitely what some ideas that I actually gave to the cardiologist yesterday that I talked to, and what I told them is you can actually do a practice medical. And then in that, just say, hey, look, I just want you to do a medical. All the AMEs are, you know, at least the ones that I have gone to are primary care physicians, internal medicine, family medicine. And I said, just do a practice one and then give me some suggestion. We're not going to put it on the form. And uh, the other thing, when I look for an AME, make sure that they have a pilot's license. I see many AMEs that are out there that don't have their pilot's license. They're just there to make a lot of money. In 15 minutes, you know, they can get their $250. So I make sure I'm talking to someone who understands what being a pilot is like. And you can definitely come up and say, can I just like do a practice one and then you give me some information. It, it's not part of the official record and not going to put it into the FAA, but they're definitely going to give you some good advice. Um, question, I have asthma and Graves disease. I have been given a special issuance last year. This year, the FAA is asking for follow-ups um, to send. Uh, well, looks like it's in some letters. So to the FAA, I thought I saw one of your slides saying that the, the DME could actually issue that, and the answer is right. So if you look, I think it's it says hyper or hypothyroidism for sure. I'll have to go back to hyperthyroidism. But see now with these khakis. Um, these are certificates that your AME can issue. This can be a whole different thing because you probably got it before those khakis got put into place. So I would actually call up your AME and make sure that hyperthyroidism forms uh, comes under a khaki that they can do. And then it's very, very easy. They can give it to you. They don't have to send anything down to Oklahoma City. Uh, let's see here. Question from Matt. Also, this may affect uh, commercial. I didn't see the, the first part of the question. Oh, up here. Okay, you're talking about Imitrex. Um, will this affect a commercial ticket or medical? It should not. Uh, let's see. Can I send a follow-up question? Absolutely. There's the email. Thanks, guys, for putting that in there for me. Um, if a private pilot is current with a third-class medical but does not drive, no driver's license, will they have to get, <laughs> will they have to get a driver's license under the pilot's protection. Okay, I think you, I think Alexis, you just found a loophole. Um, you have a driver's license and nothing to do with myself. I was just wondering. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what you could present. Uh, oh, maybe a passport? I'm just joking there. I, I really have no idea. I mean, that would be something that I would probably send a letter. If you want me to, I'll send, I'll ask that question to, uh, Probably, I don't know who to send it to yet because I gotta wait for the Pilots Protection Act to pass because I'm sure the FAA doesn't have enough information yet. They really don't know what to do yet with that. Um, when giving blood regularly, um, especially the long plasma donations, do you think flying VFR under 18,000 is safe within 24 hours? It all depends on how much blood you are gonna be producing. Um, so really what you want to do, I would wait probably longer than, I'd probably give it 48 hours after donation because you want to get that blood volume back. When you take that volume, that actually causes your, it actually causes your blood pressure to stay up. You take all that blood out, you become what we call hypotensive and you start feeling woozy and stuff. So you want to kind of build that all up. The bone marrow and everything else that's going to be making all those blood cells is going to little take a while because you took away a lot of its stuff. So I would probably go for at least 48 hours versus 24 hours. Uh, let's see here. How about Adderall? We kind of talked about that, Justin. Um, there really is nothing, at least in the AME guide that I have seen, um, that ad addresses that. So it's going to be on an individual basis, and it's going to be based on what your primary care physician that prescribed that and what kind of records they're going to be sending to your the AME that you'll be getting the certificate through. Uh, let's see. Oh, Alexis, you'll be okay. You can get that any time. Uh, Brian's on. Hey, Brian. Yeah. Um, 
send me a text on that, and we'll, I'll tell you kind of like what's going on um, over in Ann Arbor, and I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, let's see. So Brian wants to train with me for aspiring CFIs. He's a really, really great guy, and uh, he's uh, fantastic. Have you ever came close to passing out, and how do you handle it? Okay, that's from Dwayne. So you got to remember, I work in a hospital, so I can see a lot of blood, and I smell a lot of really foul-smelling stuff. And uh, so I have not. And uh, really what it is, it's the inability to maintain upright tone. So what you need to do is you need to probably, you're probably close to passing out. I always carry like a water bottle with it, and I tell, at least I have one of my pharmacy students, so always be somebody that's going to be passing out. And as long as you hydrate, Having enough fluid on board is actually going to keep your blood pressure up. So I have not. Um, I probably, even I've done aerobatics for a little while, and I've done some negative G pullovers. I've done some rolls. I really never had any problem with it. But one of the things, if you start to feel yourself pass out, do what you call that grunting thing. I'm sure you've seen like the F-16 pilots and the Blue Angels. And what they're doing is when they do and pull two Gs, your blood is always going to their legs. That's why they have that G suit that pumps it up to their brain. So you do what I call like Valsalva maneuver, where you do that grunting to pump that blood back up into your brain, and then all of a sudden that wooziness will go away because you're supplying oxygen to the brain. The brain needs glucose. The brain needs oxygen. So if you feel that way, do that <clears throat> that grunting where you're pushing that blood up into your brain, and you'll be fine. Okay. Keep going down, boy. Um, I am contemplating LASIK surgery. How does that impact the medical? It does not. Um, what it is is sometimes you can actually get a soda where if you've had the LASIK surgery for a little while, you can actually get a special issuance and they'll never really kind of like ask you ever again about uh, having corrective lenses and things like that. So LASIK surgery is actually now pretty regular in the pilot world, especially in the commercial airlines. So if if you really want to get it, I suggest you do, but uh, it really doesn't impact the medical at all. All they're really asking is can you see which way the E's are going and can you see at least close to 2020 or 2030 and also they're just making sure that if you're corrected you also can see 2020 or 2030. And Bob Dean, I'm glad the Lysinopril is working for you, Bob. Um, what should someone do if I'm filling out their forms for the medical we forget? put down one med we're taking. Got the medical issue but now afraid to go back and visit. What I would do is this, the next time you go for your medical, be it two years for a third class, put it down and then also just as a backup have a primary care physician um, saying okay, your blood pressure is pristine, you've had no side effects and then you'd be good to go. Uh, well, well, thanks, John. I really appreciate it. Do I think that a diabetic type 1 will ever be able to get a second class or a first class medical imply commercial? Um, I do, especially with uh, some of the new pumps that have come out. We have pumps now. They're called smart pumps. And what they'll do is they'll actually take your blood glucose and as long as you program it, so if you end up going, let's say, hyperglycemic, which means your blood glucose, you know this, that if it ever becomes hyperglycemic, it's going to already know it's got what I call a sliding scale on it. It reads it and it says, okay, you're at 120. I'm going to get five units of your Humalog, and then you'll be good to go. But it's, again, going to take a long time for the FAA to get used to that because they said without no uncertain terms. I mean, you could not fly if you were a diabetic. Now you have diabetes type 2. Now you have a third class special issuance. So I, it's going to be uh, probably a slam dunk that pro hopefully in the next five years that you can get a second class medical or even a first class medical and fly commercial. And just as long as things keep getting better, the meds get better, the devices get better, and we get better. Ah, oh, thanks, Michael. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see, Jason, did I miss an answer? <laughs> I think Larry missed it. Uh, let's see. So, Ron, if you can kind of like reintroduce the question here. Let me go back and see if I can find it. Uh, okay, here it is. My third class medical expires in 516. Was that the one you were talking about? When should I schedule my exam if the the <laughs> well, you're going to have to do it in 24 calendar years. So, 
that's when you would do your uh, your next uh, medical certificate appointment. Hopefully that helps. Uh, let's see. I don't see. Oh, here's a question from Alexis. When a person has a prescription filled, does that record get stored in a database? That said, can't the FAA? No. Um, so they cannot go into the pharmacy. I mean, I know the the pharmacy law in Florida. I know the pharmacy law in Michigan, and they cannot go into the database. What you report is what the FAA gets in the database. They're not the CIA. They're not the FBI. So uh, they cannot go into your record. That's your private record. And I tap into your, your CVS pharmacy or whatever pharmacy you can do. I love that question. I think that's pretty good. The FAA is okay, but they're not that great. And uh, so the best thing to do is everything that you're on and be honest and put to, if so if you're on a prescription med, put that on your certificate and you'll really never go wrong. And especially, you know, look up to the safe medication list. If you get Uncle Larry's book, you know, you'll see all the safe ones in there. I do have to make some revisions. There's been a couple medications that, new medications have been added, actually all for the good. But uh, you can use that. It's uh, very reliable. I use it all the time myself. And uh, so, no, the FAA is not going to tap into your pharmacy records. At least they better not. Let's see, any other questions? Okay. I am a disabled veteran with a rating. Does that have my impact, my third class medical? Um, the answer is no, not really, because the criteria of the third class medical is very, very, I mean, it's the same. So if you uh, have a good blood pressure, if you don't have, let's say, diabetes when you pee in the cup, and if you can see, you're good to go, but there is sometimes some restrictions depending on, you know, if you're an amputee or not an amputee and things like that. But if you want to send me a pilotlayer7 at gmail.com, I'll be do. I would love to do more research into that for you, Rudy. But right here, I, you know, I've never been asked that question, and you know, oh, there you go. Um, that I would love to help you and work with you in any kind of way. And thank you for doing service for the United States of America. We really appreciate all your help. Uh, if you need more info on the pumps and how they work, my daughter is a diabetic. Well, thanks, Stephen. I really, I try and keep up as much as I can. I'm not the diabetic specialist at the hospital, but I see diabetics all the time. So, and I do give lectures over at the medical school and things like that. So, yeah, any information you can send me, that would be great. Because, uh, you know, a good pharmacist is always learning just like a good pilot is always learning. Ah, Stephen's working on his RD. Well, congratulations to you, sir. And let's see if there's any other questions here. Because you guys know I, I get up at 3.30 in the morning, so you know, I'm working on fumes. i got my flannel uh, M0A jammies on right now, and uh, usually I go to sleep at about 9 o'clock. But anything for you guys. Cool. Uh, sport pilot, diabetes type 2, under control, never had any incident. Uh, anything special to deal with? Yeah, the answer is negative, <laughs> Jim. Uh, no problems whatsoever. With a sport pilot, you know you have your driver's license. And even being a diabetic type 2, you could still get your third class medical for second class medical or third class or first class medical. Cool stuff. Hey, Larry, why don't we uh, why don't we wrap it up on that note? Beautiful presentation, by the way, guys. Any further questions you have for Larry? I know I sent quite a few of you his email. It is pilot Larry seven at gmail.com pilotlarry7 at gmail.com Larry will that's his personal email address respond to you guys help you out in any way possible uh, I want to thank Larry for spending his time with us tonight. I want to appreciate uh, thank you guys for spending some time with us tonight so guys uh, we're going to get to go get some rest so we can kick butt here at Sebring tomorrow Larry's going to do the same so with that guys enjoy the rest of your evening and most importantly remember but a good pilot is always learning. Have a great night, guys. See ya.